CAF Trooper Scout Pilots, welcome back. Barundas here. Uh, welcome to part four of the intro to the KW. So we left you last time, I believe, up to uh, engine run-up. So we got it cranked, and uh, just before we started initializing all the systems uh, is when I broke it off. So what I'm going to do today is uh, get her cranked kind of in real time, and then I'm going to continue with the uh, right side run-up. So... <clears throat> Where we get up to uh, getting the aircraft started and get, then getting ready to fly or actually getting all the systems online as far as uh, the gyro systems, the navigation systems, etc. Uh, those are kind of relegated to the right seat. The left seat, if I skip forward in my checklist here, you can see, let me find it here, uh, engine run-up CPO pilot, right? So these are the circled steps that I talked about before. So the, the first circled step for the left seater is the PC DTSV or the mission data card load as required. So if I back up one page, I can see where step number nine in the right seater's run up is the same thing. So typically I would announce right here that uh, we're going to split on the checklist. And this is where the left seater then continues on with basically configuring the aircraft for war fighting. So going forward in the checklist to his portion, he's got to do the nav line, the aviation survivability equipment, basically all the uh, jammers, radar detectors, etc. He's got to configure that stuff. Avionics configure, which is uh, setting the radios, loading encryption keys, uh, getting the fills into the frequ frequency hopping radios, starting the MMS, which uh, there's a bore site, there is um, loading some constraints in there. There's potentially doing an airborne calibration, uh, initializing the video recorder, configuring the nav system, so making sure that the waypoints that we want uh, for the mission are properly configured in the nav system, that the targets that we want are, if we want some in the pre-point buffer, etc. cetera. Uh, initializing the improved data modem, um, which, man, that, that's like a eight-hour class right there. There's uh, there's a significant portion of the aircraft qualification is involved with um, using the improved data modem and the digital comm suite. But as I said before, and I believe we also talked about it in uh, Casmo's stream where we did the, co the podcast about uh, how much we use digital comms, uh, we use it some, but not in a lot of the ways that you may think that we used it. So there wasn't a lot of digital target handovers. We didn't do uh, lazing targets, storing them, and then sending them to other platforms like F-16s, F-18s, etc. Um, what we did use it for was a lot of situational awareness stuff, like configuring the BFT, the Blue Force Tracker. And we had uh, basically text messaging back and forth with our command post or, or our upper echelon headquarters, where uh, they could track us on a moving map, basically, with an icon and see where we were. Uh, so that that's really where the improved data modem um, capability is incorporated into the systems that we used. So I fear that there's a lot of expectation for uh, interoperability and, and some kind of Star Wars sort of uh, information sharing aspect to how many people think things happen in real life, but in a lot of cases, it's really not that sophisticated. There are capabilities, and you know, the Air Force has uh, certainly very sophisticated data sharing capabilities. But when when you start talking joint, when you talk about going between Army and Navy, and between Army and Air Force, etc., and back and forth, a lot of time there's there's a lot of friction and a lot of conflict there. So. Um, what you should expect as far as uh, data sharing on the digital side is fairly minimal. Now, we may amp it up a little bit to approach the theoretical capability of the system, in other words, what it was designed to do, but in practice and application, in many cases, we didn't actually use it in that way. So that's kind of something we can play with, and you know, we'll explore that as, as we get into the gameplay aspects. Uh, at any rate, what he's doing on that side of the cockpit is configuring all those systems, which is very time-consuming. So as the right-seater, I can actually get the aircraft 
uh, spun up, so to speak, and ready to fly in about three to four minutes. I'll talk about Navaline. Uh, the aircraft has to find itself on the Earth and kind of figure out where it is and, and get the get its inertial and navigation system spun up. That can take up to four minutes. Now, I can take off before that procedure is complete, uh, and it may actually delay that. Com so if you're flying around and moving the gyros and the aircraft around before the aircraft has initialized, that complicates its, its own setup. Um, but, for instance, in a QRF and a quick reaction force, uh, scenario, I can hop in, the right seater can get the aircraft up to 100% ready to fly in about three to four minutes probably. Get it started, get the lights on, get the radios configured, and boom, you can take off. And then the left seater can manage the rest of his tasks and route if it's a scenario where you have to get up in the air right now and get going to where you need to be. But normally it takes oh, about 10 to 15 minutes to run the aircraft up. Um, and that's in many cases, because the left seater has a lot of things to do as far as getting his systems configured. And, and so I just wanted to highlight that on his side of the task. You know, you've got everything from ASE, avionics, to weapon systems. Um, so there's a lot of configuration that has to happen there. So uh, what we'll do today is I will continue with the right seat run up. I'm not going to delve into so much of the left seat tasks. I'll blend it a little bit because the left seat of the cockpit has not been configured at this point. So that's, like I said, we're still in an alpha slash beta build. Uh, so the mechanisms that tie the left portion of the cockpit to the right, some of the MFD communication features don't uh, exactly work uh, as they're intended to yet. So those are all sort of items that we still need to work out as far as how they should interrelate to each other uh, back and forth not only within the cockpit, but within other aircraft or outside of the cockpit to other aircraft and entities as well. All right, so having laid that groundwork, uh, what we'll do is get up to engine start. If I can find it here, it should be on. Sorry, I seem to have misplaced my. There we go. Before starting engine pilot. So. You've seen this before now three times, I think. Uh, so I'm going to blast through getting the aircraft cranked to idle at sort of combat speed is what I call it. So I'm not going to stop and talk about the switch positions. This would be more uh, indicative of um, how it would flow and happen sort of in real time. So I'll leave my checklist up just so you can kind of reference where I'm at in the checklist. And I will just voice what I'm looking and touching uh, and doing as I go through the procedure. All right, so having said that, uh, we've both just hopped in. We're strapped in, so seatbelt, shoulder harness, and inertia reel fasten and check. We're both good. I confirm that verbally with my, with my left seater. Then I move to overhead panel equipment and switches check and set. So have you see, as you've seen before, I move to my center post circuit breaker panel, um, switches here. I look at my particle separator should be out, L2 mum should be off, radar warning should be on, everything else is off. I move to my aux circuit breaker panel, CMOS switch is off at this point, um, IR beacon and my MVG position lights uh, should be off since we're flying during the day, not going to use them. And these are things that I would verbalize uh, and just kind of call out as I'm going through them so that my left seater has a, a warm and fuzzy feeling that I know what I'm doing. Um, and it's just it's called uh, air crew coordination where we talk uh, as much as we think. So as you, you verbalize what you're doing and thinking so that the other crew member is kind of aware of where you're at in the checklist and, and what it is uh, that you are accomplishing as far as the switchology. All right, to my overhead aft circuit breaker panel, all these switches should be in. Uh, ignition and FADEC will come on for safety. Uh, and as required by Army regulations, anti collision light will come on. During the daytime, I don't need my console or instrument or interior cockpit lighting. Auto compartment blower will come to the auto position. All the rest of these switches are off. Uh, all my power generation switches are off at this point. I move to my uh, emergency fuel cutoff valve handle. I check to make sure that it's forward and in the locked position. I go to my free air temperature and note that it looks like it's 22 degrees. 
All right, that is overhead panel equipment and switches check and set. And I move to instrument panel instruments and switches check and set. Uh, this is a redundant step. I'm going to call it out now, but we'll see it again later in the checklist. My CMOS control indicator panel is in the off position. My RFD looks good. Nothing to note there. My vertical scales instruments installed. No cracks. Um, moving to my MFD, everything looks clean. Uh, the buttons uh, appear to be functional. Uh, I'm in the, my primary position for the uh, um, feed from the IMCPUs. My clock, I have no indications, but it is installed. I note my APR39 control head appears to be installed and in functional condition. And I move to my mag compass. I note that it is uh, full of fluid and appears to be, I'll give it a tap and make sure that it's not stuck. All right, moving to my uh, MFD aux panel. I look at my turn and slip indicator. Uh, the ball should be visible with fluid in the race. All my other switches appear to be functional. I move to my standby instruments, uh, static indications. I don't mess with my altimeter setting until I have DC power applied. I have an off flag on my attitude, standby attitude indicator, and appears to be static indications on my standby uh, airspeed indicator. I note or take a quick visual uh, glance at my FedEx Auto Manual switch uh, that the boot appears to be, you know, in good condition. There's no dust or anything wrong with it. Move to my MFD. Yep, it's installed. Nothing to note there. I move to my MFK. Uh, all buttons um, present and appear to be functional. Uh, zero eyes and emergency comm switches are down and left and right jettison cover switches down and lock wired. My armament control panel switches to the off position. We don't have a gun installed, so the switch is in the safe position. I move to my SCAS panel. Power should be off at this point. These switches are spring loaded down without power. My force trim switch should be in the on and hydraulic switch should be in the on position. I moved to my uh, communication select control panel. I put my switches as desired. So I'm going to go three down, one up, and one down. Uh, if I will change this to make this default to the re remote position, but as I talked about in the previous videos, we want this in remote and my mic type should be type one. Remote ICP, IC. S is in the off position. I can preset my volume as desired. Uh, I'll kind of just briefly mention the SATCOM control head. It should be off on that rotary switch. And then my CMOS control panel should be in the safe and the auto position. And we'll see this again later in the checklist as well. All right, that's uh, instrument panel, instruments and switches, check and set. Flight controls and switches, check and set. I'm going to give my pedals quick full range of motion, no binding, ratcheting, nothing to obstruct full motion. And I move to my cyclic without hydraulics. Uh, range of motion is limited, but I give, uh, I give the control as much movement as I can and then kind of correlate to my blades that uh, they are moving in conjunction with what I'm doing with the cyclic. And then I just briefly, this is personal technique, I just hit each button and make sure that it functions and doesn't get stuck in the down position. All right, from there I move to my collective. So I go full up, check for full range of motion, no ratcheting, binding, obstruction of movement, nothing underneath the collective uh, that might slide down there and prevent me from uh, putting it full down if I need to. I check my control head switches. I wanna make sure that my landing light, since we're not gonna use it today, I'm gonna set it to the off position. All these switches, I'll just give a quick Again, personal technique, uh, make sure that each switch uh, does what it's supposed to do and is not getting stuck in the down position. All right, from there, I open my throttle to the full open position. It does have a stop. I go back to the idle, make sure the idle detent is uh, working, and then I hit the idle detent release button and rotate it back full closed. At this point, my left seater would have said, I correlate motion on the throttle. So he would have had his hand on, the, on his throttle as well and uh, just made sure that the linkage between uh, the primary control and the left seater's control is in fact working correctly. All right, that brings us uh, to complete with step number four. We are up to battery switch bat one. Now, I should note, I would have already turned my ignition key switch to the on position when I approach the aircraft and take the key out of my pocket and put it into the ignition switch. 
and uh, just out of habit, everybody just kind of turns it to the on position as well. That doesn't do anything at this point except enable the interlock uh, to allow the ignition, um, the igniters in the combustor section to fire. So it doesn't turn the aircraft on, there's no battery power applied, etc., until you actually flip this switch up here. All right, so we're up to bat switch to bat one. So I'm going to turn that sucker on. And immediately I can see I start to get some ind indications in the cockpit. I'm waiting for my low rotor audio to enunciate. Okay, we have that right side of the cockpit comes to life. I'm going to silence my audio with one press of the acknowledge switch. All right, and that brings us to GPU connect as required. And I look to at my uh, battery voltage. I see I have 24 volts. volts. So no less than 21, so anything 20 or lower, we cannot attempt a battery start. I don't need that today since we have 24. From there, I go to, oops, sorry, uh, caution warning and advisory mes messages and audio check. So we already heard the audio, and I would have verbally announced, yep, I hear it. And by the way, on battery, I say to my co-pilot, hey, can you hear me? ICS is working. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, confirmed. ICS is good. All right. Uh, warning, caution, and advisory messages and audio. So this is uh, where I kind of break off. I'm going to turn this off, and we're going to talk about the warning, caution, and advisory system again. So right away I can see that uh, I have nine cautions and two advisories up, right? So as we talked about in the last vid, engine out and low rotor RPM rotor, rotor is normal at this point because those sensors are tripped because the, the engine's off and the rotor's not spinning. All right, AC gen failed, DC gen failed. Uh, we've already talked about. Also note that rectifier fail should be displayed here in conjunction with AC gen fail. They always go together. So uh, that will be fixed prior to release. Uh, but what I'm looking for is anything to, that will prevent a start. So as I'm cycling through these, I'm looking at these. Yeah, these all look normal. So I hit acknowledge one more time to go to the next portion of the list. Inverter fail, low oil pressure transmission, SCAS disengage, y'all. Etc. Those are all normal indications. I talked about anti-ice on in part number three. And then I have one more message. Okay, I'm going to look at that. Nav, nav not aligned. Yep, got it. Um, just to note here, I'm in gyro compass align, and this starts to happen once I'm on battery. And uh, auto is boxed. I want you to remember this. None of this information here. Uh, this will change once the aircraft is aligned. So I will reference back to this uh, gyro compass align and the auto function. Uh, as soon as battery power is applied, the aircraft starts to go through an auto alignment process. And I will talk about 20 minutes at least on this whole process about what's going on as the aircraft is doing this. But I just want you to note this now that this is what it looks like before the aircraft is aligned and it takes up to about four minutes. So if I get the aircraft cranked while this is happening, um, by the next time we go back to this page, it will probably no longer be boxed and I won't see gyro compass align anymore. Note also, if I go to my VSD right now, this is empty, so I don't have a pitch ladder because my ring laser gyros are not spun up and, and initialized yet. And I do not have, if I go to my HSD, um, oh, this is incorrect. So if I act this off, I should not have a present position at this point because the aircraft, I'm still in the Navaline process, does not know where it is. So I will note that on the er errata sheet. I hadn't noted it before. Uh, so this would be blank until we have a, a good uh, nav align process. So since this is still in auto and gyro compass align, the aircraft doesn't know where it is yet. Um, okay, enough about that. All right, so we've reviewed caution, warning, and advisories. Oh, and by the way, what I wanted to mention here is if I recall all my messages, specifically what I'm looking for is FADEC messages. So anything to prevent a start, I'm looking for uh, uh, no auto start available and FADEC maintenance required. So it runs through a quick, once it gets battery power, the FADEC computer runs through a quick bit, which is a built-in test. It tests itself and it says, hey, I'm good or I'm not good. If there's anything wrong with the FADEC computer, that will be shown on my messages here. And if I see 
within one of those flags something that says FADEC maintenance or FADEC fail or no auto start, I cannot proceed with a normal start. So I would call over maintenance and kind of will start troubleshooting the FADEC computer. So that's what I'm looking for at this point. All right, caution warning and advisory messages and audio, check. I go to my next page. FADEC auto manual switch, check to auto. All right, it is in auto, so my computer is functioning, and I don't have those messages, so there is nothing to prevent me from starting the aircraft. MPD, test and set. So right here, I go down to my multi-parameter display, and I hold my test switch in the up position. It's spring-loaded, so I have to hold it to get all the digits and the segment lights to illuminate. What I'm looking for here is to make sure that the instrument displays as it is intended to. Occasionally, uh, either some of those chiclets fail or some of the, the number segments fail. You just want to note that. It doesn't necessarily prevent you from cranking the aircraft and executing the mission. You just want to know that, hey, uh, this instrument may give you, uh, or you know, something may not illuminate when it's supposed to. I'm also going to do that, so when I hit this switch, uh, my vertical scales instruments there for my uh, NR, NP, TGT, and Torque, uh, I'm also looking that those instruments um, fully illuminate. So note the color bands, red, amber, and green. So the red are, are the basically uh, exceedance zones. Amber, you're in a transient zone where you can operate safely for a limited period of time. And then the green bands are your unlimited operation times. All right, so everything appears normal there. My aux circuit breaker control panel, CMOS switch, circuit breaker switch to CMOS. So I don't know, once again, I say, I don't know why they did it this way. Maybe it has something to do with power uh, as far as cycling the battery. So it calls for it to have it off on, on before battery and then you turn it on after battery. I don't know why. Uh, that's something I guess I can look at if anybody's super curious about it. But at any rate, we go ahead and turn that sucker on now. Control indicator CI power switch off. You, you guys remember that uh, we looked at that on uh, instrument panel instruments and switches check and set. It is off. CMOS, con CMOS control panel. We noted that the safe arm switch is to safe and bypass was in auto. The SATCOM receiver transmitter, receiver transmitter circuit breakers are out. So that is here on the uh, center circuit breaker panel. Uh, so... There's my SATCOM amplifier and my SATCOM RT control head. So these uh, circuit breakers aren't implemented as far as being actionable in the cockpit yet. I don't know why you would even want to mess with that in game. Uh, it really serves no purpose. So uh, I, we can have a conversation with PC whether to even bother to pull those out or not. Uh, for you players, it's not going to make any difference. Um, you pull that circuit breaker. You lose your, your SATCOM. Again, that's a specialized radio. I don't see any sort of application where you would use that. You have four other radios uh, to talk to your uh, squatter mates, wing mates, team mates, whatever. Um, supported ground. So plenty of radios to work with. SATCOM is over the horizon comms. Um, yeah, enough said there. All right, so those circuit breakers are out at this point. The ARC-231, which is the SATCOM radio, fill panel power switch is off. We've already done that. In the meantime, my left seater has done his portion of the run-up. So before starting engine CPO as required, he's checked his seat belts and shoulder harnesses. His circle number two, he's checked his side of the cockpit. So if I go to the left seater side, what he's doing, as I'm doing my right seat checks, is looking at his stuff. So he's setting his communications light control panel. Uh, he's looking at his MMS control panel. My laser arm standby switch should be in the off position. Uh, my first last return, this relates to the laser, whether it's reading the first pulsed return or the last pulse return. Uh, user preference, really, but standard technique is to use the last pulse return. There are some conditions on the battlefield, which uh, if you're getting false returns off of smoke or potentially an object or obstacle that is in between you and the prospective target, you are attempting delays, there could be false or numerous returns that the receiver in the MMS, in the laser rangefinder designator, 
is actually picking up. So if you are getting, uh, and I'm, I'm diverging here, but uh, if you're getting multiple returns, uh, you can kind of isolate to what makes sense. If you're getting a, a laser return that's reading 1,000 meters and then 6,000 meters and then 1,500 meters and then 6,200 meters, etc., cetera, uh, that tells me that there's some sort of return that the receiver is picking up and there's something that is uh, bouncing, that the laser is bouncing off of between you and the target you think you're lasing. So you can use your first return or your last return to kind of isolate and give you a what you as the pilot think is the best, most accurate return. Technique, generally we use last because that is the fur usually the furthest away return. So if you have a battlefield obscurant, like an infrared suppressive smoke or a visually suppressive smoke in between you and the, and the target, um, those are countermeasures. Um, you might get a, a return off the first laser pulse. Uh, so you would select first or last to kind of isolate which one you're using. All right, so that just blew two minutes on something we're not even going to be worried about until much, much later uh, in, in these videos. All right, the rest of it is uh, video controls for the MMS, uh, the TV system, and the uh, thermal imaging system. So the uh, quick mnemonic here is two down, one up, one down, and my MMS mode select switch should be in the off position right now. The rest of these switches underneath the uh, left seater's MFD relate to functions that will optimize the video image. So automatic low frequency gain limitation, uh, TIS integration, um, which is overlapping images uh, to try to attempt to refine the picture, um, linear motion control, automatic leveling equalization, a uh, whole bunch of stuff that is uh, another several hours of talking, which we're not going to get bogged down in right now. L2 MUM, um, has to do with uh, the encryption for the feed that goes up and down to the uh, transmitting source. So if you have, uh, if you're trying to uh, lock into, let's say, a, um, a scan eagle or a predator or a shadow video feed or even an A10 sniper pod or an F18, F16, anybody that's pumping out video and they're uh, doing that on an encrypted channel, that's what this switch does. You might enable encryption or disable encryption. IDM brings up your um, your digital comms menu interface. Uh, so the init key right here, if you press down on this, that's the same as if I go to my uh, press this circular button um, on the right seater side, which always brings me back to my initial page, which is my top menu page to access everything else in the cockpit. So my init key I press this switch down, does the same thing as that round button down here. Don't get confused with this init key right here. What that does is uh, cycle, the, it's like a physical switch uh, between the L2 MUM system and the aircraft control display system. So when I reference the CDS, that is the uh, aircraft software. L2 MUM, or the man to man teaming feature, which is what I was talking about. Uh, as far as receiving or transmitting video feeds to other stations is a federated system. And federated means it is not integrated into the aircraft. So there's actually a separate computer. It was uh, actually a Windows laptop that was here behind the Copilot station. Um, and it had separate wiring. That's what all this gobbledygook is right here. So there was a, a black box, so to speak, that ran the L2 MUM computer. And in order to see the image or access the L2 MUM uh, features and be able to interact with it, I would have to cycle my MFD and press, by pressing the init key on the MFD to switch my feed from the aircraft system or CDS to the L2 MUM computer. Uh, the danger there is that uh, none of my aircraft features, if I'm on the L2 MUM feed, uh, work. So I press this switch and I can see my L2 MUM. I press it again to go back to my, my VSD, my HSD, my comm page, etc. So that's what that key is for. Don't confuse that with this one right here, which always brings you back to your top level uh, CDS menu page. We call that the init page. Uh, so KW was kind of the first... 
uh, not the first, but it was uh, one of the first practical aircraft to use the concept of man-to-man -man teaming. So at the time I was flying it, like I said, we had a federated system. It was kind of installed in the aircraft, but it was not yet integrated into the aircraft, if that makes sense. Now with the Echo Model Apache, man-to-man -man teaming is, is kind of the new modern way of doing things. It is all part of the aircraft software. So uh, cycling between uh, feeds like this is not necessarily done in this way anymore. Now it is, it is, uh, it's all part of Windows, so to speak. All right. Uh, so here we are, 30 minutes into it, and I haven't even got the aircraft cranked yet. Uh, when I had intended to just get her started, but um, hopefully I haven't lost you, so let's get this aircraft started right now. Uh, so I'm up to fire guard. We don't have one. That's okay. Rotor blades clear and untied. I got two clear left and two clear on the right. Engine start accomplish. All right, so what I do now is I do my dummy check, ignition key switch on, and my FADEX circuit breaker switch is in the on position, and I go ahead and rotate my throttle. To the idle detent. That tells FADEC, hey, you're about to execute the start. All right. I yell clear. That lets anybody within earshot outside of the aircraft know, hey, we're turning blades. I hit this switch for 1001, 1002. Start motor is engaged. I see a rise in NG. My eyes start tracking in here. I got to have a minimum of 14 volts after 10% NG, I got that, I got 17. TGT is on the rise, so I have light off. Now I gotta have engine oil pressure by 18%, or correction, light off by 18%, and engine oil pressure by 20%. You can see the blades turning at 25%. Lots of talk in there. The aircraft is started. Now what I'm doing is monitoring TGT to make sure there are no exceedances, and I'm looking for starter drop off to go to at or near zero at 50% NG. All right, so my starter uh, was disengaged at 50% NG, so my start voltage went to at or near zero. Now I'm just waiting for the aircraft to stabilize at 64, 63 to 65% NG. It looks like we're stable at 64 and a half, so I know I've got a good self-sustaining start. All right, so the very next thing we do, transmission oil pressure and engine oil pressure within limits, so I look down here, Yep, I'm in the green bands. Now, at combat speed, I go DCAC essential fuel boost, uh, IFF particle separator, and filter bypass switch. So that would be DCAC essential fuel boost, IFF on, particle separator in, then my eyes go to the EBF filter bypass switch and note doesn't appear to be flickering, so we do not have a bypass condition or impending bypass condition on the engine barrier filter. All right, that takes us down to the next page, which is PC DTSV mission load as required. So that is a circled step, number nine for the right seater. However, if I go to the next page, that is number one for the left seater after the engine is started. So I would announce at this point, hey, let's go ahead and break on the checklist or separate on the checklist. The left seater at this point continues on with all of his tasks. So he's executing nav line, aviation survivability equipment, configuring the radios and the avionics, MMS startup, etc. Like all that stuff I talked about half an hour. Ago. All right, so I'm going to continue with the right seat run up and we can sort of cooperatively do this very first step. So just to review, the PC DTSV are the the data cards that there's four of them and they're the old style PCM CIA cards, the PIMCA cards is what we call them. Uh, there's four of them in a receptacle right behind the right seater's head. So there's a little door that you would open. Uh, you typically carry two of the cards with you and two of them remain in the aircraft. So the four cards are the engine data card, the video card which records all the video, uh, the emission data card, and the map card. So you Typically, what we took out was the mission data card and the map card. Sometimes the map card just stayed in it because it doesn't change all that often. The mission data card came out every single time. So on that mission data card is the information that we would have downloaded to it from the from the from the planning station, the ground computer that we used in our 
um, CP or talk our tactical operations center um, that contain the waypoints our frequencies or sometimes encryption data etc um, so that card would slide into the slot in the back uh, in the back of my head and we have to download that data from the card into the aircraft now this isn't necessarily required if there are no changes to the information that you want to put in, into the aircraft. So if you're flying the same nav points every day, etc., and there's nothing that you want to see changed, uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, go through a data load. But for technique, we always did. So uh, what we're doing here is accessing at L4 the data loader for the after a battery start or after the first start of the day I have to uh, put the password in so that default password is one two three four five six seven eight I know that's really tough to guess and then I hit enter and now I have uh, unlocked the mission data card so if I have if I need to do this again um, I don't have to put that password again as long as I'm on this battery cycle if I turn the aircraft off and recycle the battery, I got to put that password in again. So you can see we have three slots for missions. So I can put three different missions on here, and they can be loaded in flight. So if you have a gunnery mission and a instrument evaluation mission, whatever, uh, you can load different waypoints in each mission and different comm data, and then load those into the aircraft. I can also store stuff to that card to take with me when I step away from the aircraft. So uh, I could store in slot one, two, or three. So what I'm going to do today is load mission one. So you can see that everything is boxed. So everything that has a box around it is what will be uh, taken off the data card and put into the aircraft. I'm, I'm going to deselect initial position. All right, so here's where we start talking about why. So initial position is what tells the aircraft where it is. So if you were to, for instance, fly the aircraft from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to a port, let's say uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and you're going to put it on a boat to take overseas to Kuwait or Europe or Africa or wherever, uh, or you put it on a C-5 or C-17 and you fly it around the world, the last thing the aircraft knows is where it shut down the last time. Um, the initial position is where you're telling the nav system to look where it tells itself it is to start looking for satellites uh, to start the Navaline process. I want to deselect initial position uh, because the aircraft basically knows where it shut down the last time so if I shut down in the US and the next time I crank it uh, I'm in Kuwait um, it's looking for satellites based on where it thinks it is back in the US in that case, I could put an initial position in and tell the aircraft, hey, buddy, you're now in Kuwait. Um, but typically, I don't want to use that because it's more efficient for the aircraft to uh, look for satellites based on its last known position um, than to tell it you are here when uh, that position, if you pull it off the computer on the ground planning station, may not, in fact, be where it is physically. I know that's kind of confusing. Uh, but nine times out of ten we would deselect initial position because we don't we want the aircraft to find itself where this like I said where it becomes important is if there is a large variance in where the aircraft thinks it is and where it's running up and looking for satellites because if it's looking for satellites based on a whole geographically different position on the earth that could be problematic for the Navaline line process. All right, so at that point, I hit load and just wait. Now, there's uh, sometimes some beeps and tones associated with this. If I'm loading uh, anti-jam codes into the UHF, etc., cetera, um, there, there are some little ticks and beeps and um, notes that are uh, pulled in as the aircraft is as the radios are loading certain secure data off the card and into the radios. Now I can see though that I'm loaded. We'll have to change this. These should unbox once the load procedure is complete. 
Uh, and I gotta remember, I think it says load complete when that procedure is complete. So for immersion, I will note that, hey, we should have an, in these things should unbox after about 10 seconds as the aircraft has pulled all the data off the card. Uh, so you should know that everything went, went into the aircraft from the card. Then I go back to my initial page. So that is PCS, PC DTSV mission load as required. All right, so you see this note here, standby altitude must indicate above sea level for the EGI to align properly. So this is, all right, so we're going to get in the weeds about the EGI. So the embedded uh, GPS inertial systems. So those are uh, two separate but cooperative systems that work together uh, to tell the aircraft where it is on the face of the earth, um, which way it's facing, uh, referencing nav data, etc. So the inertial system is, is actually the primary navigation system. The GPS is what back is what backs it up and updates it continually. So a little bit of history. Back in the old days, um, we had only inertial systems. So this is back in the late 80s. Uh, aircraft navigation systems ran off of gyros, uh, which would be the inertial system. And those gyros measure turns and rates of turn and how far you turned. And from that, they can calculate and guess where you are based on the movement of the aircraft in relation to the gyros. Well, eventually those will drift just due to uh, manufacturing tolerances. You know, nothing is a perfect system. So any uh, purely inertial system will eventually drift, and it could be a matter of hours or it could be a matter of several hours. In the old days, what we had to do occasionally, uh, once every few hours, was do what's called a nav update. So you would fly to a known location where you know you physically are on the, on the surface of the Earth, and then you would hit a button on the HSD. Let me see if it's here. Uh, I would hit nav update, and I would tell the aircraft uh, so it's not functional yet, and honestly we don't need it because we have GPS now, but I would hit nav update and then a waypoint button would come up and you would tell the aircraft you are at waypoint, uh, let's say 27, and that location is grid whatever it is. So you're telling the aircraft, you're telling the aircraft you're here on the map uh, because the inertial system may have drifted and it thinks it's somewhere where it's actually not. So that, that nav update procedure was kind of key to occasionally just reset the nav system. Well, with the advent of GPS, we don't need to do that anymore because uh, now the, the inertial system receives periodic updates from the GPS. So the GPS is constantly telling it, you're here, you're here, you're here. So if everything is working correctly, the inertial system never really drifts because it's receiving constant updates from the GPS system. The rest of the uh, aircraft instrumentation, so for instance, the pitch attitude or the attitude heading reference system, AHARS, uh, uses the inertial system or the, the ring laser gyros. There's two of them, one under each seat. That's where those gyros are located um, to provide uh, pitch, pitch and attitude and roll data to the attitude indicators. Uh, it will the, um, your heading is referenced off the inertial system, etc. The weapon systems use the inertial system. The MMS uses the inertial system, etc. So basically, what GPS does is it is it updates and augments the inertial system. All right. So all that to explain. Um, the first thing I got to check if, for whatever reason. Uh, if my al if my MSL altitude due to an erroneous altimeter setting, if this indicates uh, below sea level, which is possible, you can just rotate this altimeter setting and make this read below uh, sea level pressure altitude. Uh, that will really gum up the nav align process. So you got to make sure that if you are for some reason you got a, a cold front. Um, that or a warm front that moved through that lowered your pressure altitude, this may indicate below sea level. We're only at 50 feet right now. So it wouldn't take much altimeter wise or pressure wise to have this go below zero MSL altitude. Uh, that would gum up the nav, the nav, uh, nav line process. All right, so nav line initiate as required. That's a left seat task, you note, but the right seater 
can do it just as well as the left seeder. So I go to my initial page and I go to my nav align page. So right now, so there, I'm going to explain all this stuff here. Lat and long, everybody should know what that is. So my northing and my easting, um, and I'm in lat long mode. So I have two modes. I can go to UTM mode or lat long mode. If I go to UTM mode or universal transverse mercator mode, uh, that places the aircraft into uh, the military grid reference system mode. So this is what the Army talks. I should note that this is an error right here. So the aircraft has the capability to get uh, an eight-digit grid. So this is the grid zone identifier, which is taken from the first two digits of a, of a universal trans transverse mercator grid location, and it, the military turns that into a grid zone identifier. And this is a further, this is a 10... Uh, 10,000 meter zone identifier. And from there we go to an easting and a northing. Um, this should only have four digits in it right now. So there are some systems out there uh, for targeting like uh, the B1 or Predator or Global Hawk uh, may use a 10 digit grid to put into a JDAM or some other precision munition. Um, but for navigation it's not really required. So just for your general funded knowledge, uh, a eight digit grid, so this should be four digits here and four digits here, this one will fall away. An eight digit grid gets you 10 meter accuracy. So that first digit, if you had what we would call a four, or correction, a two digit grid, would be within a 10,000 square meter box. So that would get you on the surface of the earth within 10,000, any place within a 10,000 square meter reference box. Next comes 1,000 meters, then 100 meters accuracy, and then finally 10 meter accuracy. So with an eight digit grid, four digits there for my easting and four digits for my northing, um, I get 10 meter accuracy. That 10 digit grid, if I have five digits in my easting and northing, uh, gets me a one meter accuracy which for navigation is not really required so and i don't believe there's any aircraft in the army inventory that really use a 10 digit grid for navigation and that's a lot of numbers that you'd be reading off if you're trying to read a grid all right we can note that auto is no no longer boxed so my auto align process has completed and as i said before that takes about four minutes uh, so the aircraft now knows where it is um, gyro compass align is no longer uh, displayed and on my VSD I do have a pitch ladder and I do have a present position displayed so I know that my aircraft knows where it is on the earth and that my all my attitude uh, reference systems are working back to my initial page and have a line all right this right here my mag heading uh, should correlate to which way I'm facing so 133 if I go back to my VSD I'll look at yep that, that is, in fact, the, the direction I'm facing. Elevation 14 meters. So if I'm in UTM mode, everything is in metric. If I go back to lat long, it puts it back into uh, statute or standard um, distances. So in that case, it turns into 45 feet. Now, I can, if I'm putting something in, I can always, for instance, if I'm in lat long mode, I can always enter a value and put F or M behind it, and the, the system will just transpose uh, to the other value. So if I'm in lat long mode and I put in 45 uh, M, uh, it will turn 45 M into approximately, what is it, times three, so that's 90, 135 feet. Uh, if you don't put the F or the M behind it. It just assumes that you're entering that value in the default measurement system that the system is currently in. Uh, so we always use UTM uh, for all our tactical purposes. So I'm going to change it to my UTM mode so that I have my MGRS, my military grid reference system displayed. The fast key is for doing a fast alignment. This will allow you to do a uh, about a 30 second alignment, but the stipulation here is that you must have stored the aircraft position on shutdown and not moved it more than 50 meters uh, 
uh, for fast align to work. So if I hit fast, it's going to go back to my mission data card and pull its last stored position and use that as well as its heading. Um, so you can't change the heading by more than, I want to say it's 15 degrees. Uh, this is kind of nitinoid numbers. Um, so you can't change the, basically you can't move the aircraft if you want to do a fast alignment and you had to have stored that position and that heading uh, via the uh, mission data card. So I would have had to go store data in mission one, store. Um, so I want to store everything. I could hit store and it takes all that information and it loads it to the card. Then if I want to do a fast align, I can hit fast and it will suck all that data off the card and I can be nav aligned within about 30 seconds. The stipulation being the aircraft cannot have moved. Um, from its stored location, which is not really realistic because whenever we shut down, the ground crew would come out, they'd throw the ground handling wheels on it, and we'd wheel it back into the hangar. So the aircraft will have moved in heading and in position, so fast align was never really a viable option. Nav mode uh, isolates uh, for troubleshooting, whether you are in GPS pure, INS pure, or a blended mode. So normal operation, we are in blended mode, as I talked about. If we have a problem with one or other of the systems, I can use this key to put it in GPS mode or INS mode and then kind of figure out which one of the systems is failing. Ship align is used when I'm, uh, for instance, embarked on a Navy ship and we are cranking the aircraft uh, while it is underway. So a ship will have, you know, some, some speed that it's moving. Uh, for instance, let's say it's 20 knots and it's going in a direction of 270. Uh, so the, not only is the ship moving, but the aircraft may be facing in a direction that it is not moving. So if the aircraft is facing 360, but it is moving sideways on the ship at a 270, that can cause the nav system to get a little bit wonky. So if I am on a ship and I'm cranking it up, I need to tell the aircraft, hey, you're moving at 30 knots at 270 while you're facing 360, just so that it uh, doesn't confuse itself as it's trying to look for satellites and, uh, doing the nav align process. All right, so all that brings me to what is occurring as we are nav aligning. So in the center box here, I can I can see my GPS sat data. So right now I'm, I'm receiving four satellites in the clear, which is a uh, normal indication. Three are the minimum required for good triangulation. Four gives you uh, a little bit of redundancy and, and backup data. So if you're not familiar, there's a constellation of, I believe it's 24 uh, GPS satellites um, that the US government launched into space in the late 80s. Uh, and this ties in with the SA and AS flag here. So selective availability and anti-spoofing and key verified. So in the early days, it was a uh, military only system, right? Um, which means that it was not necessarily available to any and all people that happen to have a GPS receiver. Uh, and in those days, basically nobody did. So uh, to get the full accuracy of the GPS capability, which is down to a one meter accuracy, you had to have the selective availability keys. Um, so what the way GPS works is that each satellite puts out a timing signal. It has a an extremely precise clock on each satellite and each one of those satellites beams out a timing signal. So the GPS that you have in your car or on your e or you know on your handheld receiver is uh, receiving a signal from one of those satellites and it's comparing the timing signal that it's receiving from each one that it sees to the other ones and from there it can compare the timing signals and determine your location on the Earth. Well, in order to limit the precision of that console or that GPS information, you can dumb it down basically. So in the early days of GPS, you had to have a military encryption key to receive the full precision signal from the satellites. 
In the mid 90s, the Clinton administration decided GPS is important to the world, so they turned off the selective availability and made the full precision signal available to everybody. So that's when GPS really took off. So when Garmin kind of, you know, uh, commercially became viable, when airliners, uh, commercial shipping, everything uses GPS now. By the way, we use GPS for a lot of uh, weapons targeting. Um, if it ever came down to it, and we got into a no kidding life or death war with somebody, uh, it is possible that we could turn off the full precision signal and turn selective availability back on, which would dumb down the precision or the the precision of the signal that the GPS receivers can interpret from the satellites to about, I believe it's about 300 meter plus or minus accuracy. So your car, airliners, uh, commercial shipping on the oceans, you know, mapping, UAVs, everything will be affected uh, if they no longer have that full precision signal that is now freely available. Uh, if we turned on selective availability again, that would affect a lot of things. All that to say that it's not that's not the deal now. So um, we never really in the last 20 years had to deal with having keys loaded to get the full precision signal from the satellites because it's just out there all the time anyway. So we didn't bother with it. So what you're seeing right here now is as if the keys were loaded uh, and selective availability was turned on and anti-spoofing was turned on. So those are all safety features uh, to make the GPS more resistant to erroneous signals and to receive the full precision signal only with the proper encryption keys loaded into the system. Uh, so we would normally just have, um, uh, I think it was AS flagged and no key verified because we didn't need it. So uh, that's a little background history for you there. All right, I believe I've covered everything on this page here. So we are Navline initiate as required, complete. All right, let's move to uh, radar altimeter check. So the radar altimeter, just to give you a little background, is a uh, is a transceiver on the bottom of the aircraft. There's two uh, antennas, uh, one forward and one aft. And basically, they're just uh, about palm-sized flat plates that are on the bottom skin of the aircraft, and they beam a convergent signal down directly underneath the aircraft, which bounces off the ground, and then they pick up that signal, and they measure how far above the ground you are. So if I'm looking at my VSD, uh, this number right here is my radar altitude, radar altimeter altitude. Uh, this number right here is my pressure altitude. So <clears throat> it reads two right now because those antennas are on the bottom skin of the aircraft, which due to the skid height reads more than one feet, but generally about two feet. So that's kind of a normal indication because that signal is bouncing off the ground and getting back to the bottom of the helicopter. My radar altimeter works uh, with a vertical scale here that will rise and fall on this scale uh, up to 200 feet and then that scale will blank out. Uh, the digits will go from 0 to 200 feet and I, I believe we still need to fix above 200 feet this box becomes smaller and from 200 or above 200 feet up to a, a thousand feet it's actually small digits. Below 200 feet it becomes big digits. Uh, so uh, this is a going back to the vertical scale that works in conjunction with this digital readout this scale will move up and down based on your altitude, and this is 0 to 200 feet, so this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, 100 feet, 150 feet, and 200 feet. The reason it's 200 feet is because that's what's considered terrain flight altitude. That's what we're concerned with when we're flying helicopters uh, at terrain flight altitudes is 200 feet and below. Above 200 feet, this vertical scale um, will blank out, however your digits will remain and tell you how many feet you are above the ground and radar altitude always reads AGL or above ground level altitude. Pressure altitude is different that is measured from the pedostatic system and tells you based on your altimeter setting your pressure altitude above mean sea level. 
uh, and this is what aircraft you know you have QNH and QNE um, QNE is above 18,000 feet where you set it to a standardized setting uh, so that everybody is on the same altitude reading uh, or QNH or QN home is where you set it to the local altimeter setting so if I rotate this dial my pressure altitude would change here based on what my local pressure is uh, ambient. Um, so we're going to make sure that our radar altimeter works correctly. Alright, so I've already noted uh, previously I believe that the left and the right side of the cockpit aren't fully integrated together yet. So as a technique what I would do is uh, have my VSD up on the right side so that I could look at my vertical scale moving as I'm doing the check and the left the left seater could initiate the radar alt check for me because uh, the left side systems aren't fully integrated yet what I'm going to do is reverse that I'm going to put my VSD up on the, on the left side and I'm going to go to do my uh, initial page and my fiddle menu and then do my radar altimeter test from the right seat. So I want you to know when I press this button what happens over here and I'll talk through it. You're going to see that vertical scale rise. It's going to go to full deflection at 200 feet and it's going to blank out. Uh, the digital instrument will scale up to a thousand feet and then it's going to come back down. Now it's already noted that we incorrectly coded how this test works because I didn't explain it quite well enough to the to the main coder so what he implemented was what he believed I said and then we need to go back and fix how this works so basically what you're gonna see is the test running twice which is not correct it only runs once but I will talk through it so that you can see it so radar altimeter check is I'm gonna hit radar altimeter you can see that vertical scale go all the way up to 200 feet and then it blanks out my digital scale rises to a thousand then it went to a thousand briefly and then back down then it scales back down at 180 feet on the back, way back down, you saw the vertical scale instrument reappear and go back down. That should, all that should only happen once. You're getting to see it twice. You can see radar altimeter no go right here. As soon as the test passes, that will deflag, and I see radar altimeter test go. Going back to my VSD, uh, the criteria that I have to look at as the pilot is. Um, did my radar altimeter start at an acceptable setting? So what is acceptable is uh, anything less than five feet to start with. So it's a variance. Two is kind of optimal. I can go up to four um, or less. If it's four, if it's higher than four, in other words, five, there's something wrong with the calibration of that radar altimeter. So it's as it's sitting on the ground, I don't want to read five, six, seven feet because I know that's not correct. Um, then it's going to go up to a thousand feet and it's going to come back down and it has to um, return to the same value that it started at. And that's my radar altimeter check. Okay, uh, then I move to my FADEX system check. So, to prevent uncontrollable rotor overspeed and damage to the drivetrain components, do not switch to the manual mode unless collective is full down and throttle is at idle. That's a note, if my collective is anything off of the down stop uh, and my throttle is not at idle, the FADEC reads that as flying. And if I go to the manual mode, it reverts to that manual setting, so I may get way more violent fuel flow um, than I'm prepared to deal with while I'm on the ground. So that's what this caution is for. i got to make sure that my collective is full down and that my throttle is at the idle D10. Alright, so the reason we're checking the FADEC system, as I explained before, the FADEC controls all fuel functions to the engine in normal operation. So the computer basically is metering based on load, demand, and anticipation of demand, how much fuel is going into the engine to keep the NG section fed, to keep the power turbine at 100%, to keep the rotor at 100%. That's its entire purpose in life, is to keep that rotor or NR at 100%. Uh, I want to make sure that if that computer fails that I can take manual control of the, the fuel metering so I can limp the aircraft back to the ground in an emergency mode. So the way we do that is we isolate the FADEC computer and revert to a manual mode. And I do that by pressing this button. Um, so what's going to happen at that point 
uh, when I press that button I'm going to hear my FADEC audio enunciate and I'm going to see FADEC manual display in my caution so that tells me that I am in the FADEC mode I will also see here that it will say manual in amber my NG I expect to rise anywhere from three to five percent and that is because when I put it in the manual mode uh, there's a there's a slight rigging difference between how it is mechanically rigged to the throttle the cable that goes back to the HMU which is that's the hydromechanical unit think of it as the carburetor or the fuel injection on the engine which is normally computer controlled but if you take the computer out of the loop you are now controlling how much fuel goes into that thing manually well well the difference between how it's mechanically rigged and computer controlled is about three to five percent NG so when I bring it to the manual mode I'm listening for a change in the engine noise and I'm looking for a rise in NG of about three to five percent so I note my throttle is full down my idle is a detent I go ahead and take it to the manual mode I hear my FADEC audio enunciate I acknowledge and act it off and I see that we are in FADEC manual right now Note that my NG rose about 2.5% to 67, which is exactly what I'm looking for. And then to make sure that my throttle cable is rigged proper properly, I'm going to open that throttle just a touch and look for a rise in NG. Okay, so my, my NG did rise, and then I'm going to bring it back to the idle detent, and my NG should stabilize back to where it was in the manual mode. Okay, now my FADEX system is responding as I expected to to manual inputs. I know that it is working, so I am going to press that FADEX auto manual switch back to the auto position. My FADEX manual indication should disappear, and my NG should stabilize back between 63 and 65%. That is FADEX auto manual or FADEX system check for the first flight of the day. I don't need to do that on any subsequent crank on this flight day but I do do it on every subsequent day when it's the first flight of the day. All right, moving on to standby flight instruments set. So all that is is setting my altimeter. So in the meantime, uh, after I loaded my comm settings, I probably would have tuned my UHF radio to the ATIS, ATIS Automatic uh, Terminal Information Service, uh, if I'm in an airport, which is giving me my altimeter setting, my winds, my departure and uh, landing direction on the runways, etc. So I, I will be listening for my altimeter setting and I will go ahead and set that at that time. So that is um, basically uh, configuring my pitot-static system for the local altimeter setting. Uh, this instrument is not working right yet, so as I rotate this, uh, that needle is not behaving correctly. So let's say my altimeter is 2989. Uh, so bring it down here. So that, that needle should be changing 10 feet for each digit that increments there. So 2989, and you can see that it didn't move more than 10 feet or so. So this number would have changed radically uh, for that almost 200 foot change in altimeter set. It should have changed uh, 200 feet here. So that's something we're going to fix prior to release. All right. So I can see that my standby attitude indicator is still caged. So I want to uh, rotate it and pull it. So pull to cage. So I'm going to turn the instrument on, uncage it, and I'm going to hold it to the rear position to allow the gyro to cage. So clearly this is not working yet. That instrument would have wobbled as the gyro is caging itself. So you can kind of uh, you would you would note that it wobbles up and down and then it sort of stabilizes and once it's stabilized I release that button and now my standby attitude indicator is caged. Nothing I do with my standby airspeed indicator so that is standby flight instruments set. MPD bit reset switch check. Alright from there I go to my MPD. So what I'm looking for here um, is I'm going to self-test this instrument so to make sure that it's not reading uh, any erroneous signals from the instrumentation. Note that right now I have a warning flag after the start. That is because uh, on the engine start my pressures and temperatures were probably out of tolerance 
for what would be normal um, normal indications for the instrument to read. So when I put this into the bit mode, the built-in test mode, it will give me a program number 150-005 and then it will display an error which has to do with hey there is some reading on this instrument that was out of tolerance probably the engine pressure if it was a cold day where the pressure was so high that it went outside of the out of the capability of the instrument to read so MPD bit reset switch check the first thing I'm going to do is put it in bit mode so there's my program number that it's looking for and it's noting zero errors okay so as it ran through its bit it's functioning normally then I'm going to reset it and let it spring back to the center loaded position my warning flag is gone so that instrument is functioning normally flight controls check alright so this is where the pilot and the co-pilot basically make sure that everything's connected normally so if I can see my tip pad in here, let's see. All right, well, so you, you're going to see that I'm going to move my flight controls a little bit. What I want you to see is the rotor tip path plane. So I'd be looking at this as I'm sitting in the cockpit. So I'm going to give my, my uh, pedals a little wiggle. Uh, not much because I don't want to put a whole lot of torque and stress on the tail boom while, I'm, while we're uh, on the ground. But I can feel the aircraft wiggle a little bit. Then I'm going to move my cyclic. So as I go forward on the cyclic, I can see my rotor tip path plane dip down, left, right, and aft. So I'm looking for correlation in that rotor tip path plane as I move my flight controls. Now I want to make sure that my swash plate linkages, my push pull tubes, and PC links, everything is connected and everything is behaving as I expect it to. So this is a nice feature and something we talked at length with PC about. That rotor, that, that rotor disc is not static. So uh, right now we have an unloaded system. We're still at idle. I haven't even brought the aircraft up to 100% yet. Nevertheless, all my linkages are mechanically functioning, right? So if I put left cyclic in, you can see that rotor tip path plane reacting to the swash plate moving as it's pushing those blades to change their pitch. And here I am moving the cyclic forward and aft, etc. So this is what I'd be looking for in the aircraft to make sure that my uh, my rotor is responding as I expect it to to my flight control inputs. As I raise my collective, I should get a uh, a little bit of a coning effect on that rotor. So as I put some pitch into the system and I start to generate some lift, the rotor should start to cone a little bit, which is what I'm seeing here. So I just kind of check that as I go through checking my flight controls. All right, so I'm, I'm pretty satisfied that my flight controls are checking out okay. Last, I'm going to review my my warnings, caution, and advisories one more time prior to going to my throttle full open. Um, so everything looks normal here. I have my four, so I'm going to act through these, recall them one more time. All right, everything looks normal. Nothing to prevent me from bringing the aircraft up to 100%. Now I'm going to do throttle open. So from there, I'm just going to start rolling my throttle slowly open, and my eyes are tracking here to my vertical scale instrument, noting my MP and my NR. So I don't want to do this all at once. So this is kind of a smooth, controlled, and slow motion, because if I wrap the throttle open, my torque will spike very high, probably 80%, 90%. And uh, I, I get a lot of yaw effect, and there's even potential to get the aircraft to move on its skids particularly in the winter if we're on ice. It's not unheard of if you open the throttle too quickly for you to end up facing a different direction than when you started. So I want to carefully start opening my throttle and I note my NP increasing. And MP always drives NR. So NR should always be dragging along with MP. And as I open it, I'm listening for my low rotor, so I expect to cut that to come on at 90%. Okay, there's my low rotor enunciation. And that is just uh, reinitializing the low rotor audio as it retrips that that trip point below 90% on the way up. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and silence that audio. Oh, I guess I can't silence it. Um, and as my NR drags above 97%, that low rotor audio should turn off regardless whether I silenced it or not. 
Now, normally this would happen much faster, so it wouldn't bother silencing the audio. Um, it would just come on momentarily as I'm bringing the throttle open and then silence as I got to my low rotor audio trip point at 97% and it would silence itself because I'm no longer in that condition. So now I note that my throttle is at 100%. I want to cycle my MPD to my uh, NR and MP display and I just want to remind everybody that this should read NR. We're going to fix that. So uh, my MPD backup numbers right here which are controlled by this button I should say MFD backup. So this line of data right here, throttle position, RPM, engine torque, and mass torque are read from, from here. Um, the next step is going to be RPM trim switch adjust to 100% NR. So I'm going to do that uh, from my MPD. So this number here is going to correlate to this number is going to correlate to this number. So I can see right now it says RPM 100% and uh, RPM what appears to be 100% here but it's not really and this is 99 so there's a note in the dash 10 that says the uh, MFD backup value is generally about 1 to 2% higher than the MPD value so this is what I actually use to set my rotor speed setting uh, and I want to talk about this, this this vertical scale instrument right here so this green band right here and these bands here indicate some transient ranges uh, so green normally means good, right? So this is the normal operating zone. So 97 to 100% uh, NR is the normal operating zone for my rotor. However, these chiclets don't uh, illuminate until that value is reached. So right now what you're really reading is less than 100%. could be 99.9, .9, but it's less than 100. So what I want to see once I set my rotor to 100% is one chiclet above 100 because that means I've reached 100 and it is somewhere between uh, 100 and 101. This segment of lights will blank out and I will only have one amber chiclet here to indicate that I am in the 100 to 105 range, or sorry, 100 to 107 range for my transient condition for the rotor. So these, these chevrons here indicate my transient range that is acceptable to be in. 90 to 107 is the, the transient range for the rotor. Uh, so kind of counterintuitively, um, by, to set my rotor at 100%, it needs to blank this line of digits out and um, have one amber chiclet. It's a dumb way of displaying it, but nevertheless, it is what it is. So that's what I'm looking for. So at uh, RPM trim switch adjust to 100%, that's on my collective. So this is the RPM trim switch where I set my rotor RPM. And this can control uh, through FADEC uh, my NP and subsequently my NR from 95 to 105%. So I could beep. We call it beeping. I could beep my RPM down to 95 and all the way up to 105%. So what I want to do is set my RPM so that my rotor is at 100. And I would do that in the aircraft by uh, basically bumping this switch three times. So by feel, I just reach down and I go one, two, three. And that would increase my RPM from 100 to, or from 99 rather, to 100. You can see where now I've transitioned uh, so that it's reached 100% and it's indicating 100 on the RPM there. So I'm reading my throttle position is at 100%. My RPM is 101, which is correct. This is what I want. My engine torque is 26, 25 and my mass torque is 26. So all's gravy. I've got my RPM set to uh, 100%, which is where I want it to be. So I no longer need this number. I go ahead and cycle it down to my fuel quantity and my engine torque percentage. This is the number I'll be referencing most often in flight anyway. I can change this at any time uh, if I want to look at some other numbers. For instance, if I want to read the AC voltage and the rectifier voltage, etc. I talk at length about this in, uh, I think it's video number three. Just a quick review, because my AC generator is now online, I'm reading 115 AC volts, and my rectifier, which is tied to the AC generator, is providing my DC voltage, and my rectifier load percentage should be, yeah, 97%. Now, this right here should drop off, because my, my start generator, 
or um, otherwise known as my DC generator, is now no longer doing anything except charging the battery. So once I once my AC generator kicks on, uh, this will drop to about 12% or so. So we'll we'll fix this number as well, just for immersion. Not that it means anything to you guys as a player, but once my AC generator is online and my rectifier is providing the DC voltage by turning AC into DC, uh, my start generator now is not doing anything but charging the battery. So this this load value, and this should be percent right here, that label, will drop way, way down to about 12% once the battery is uh, kind of fully charged. All right. I've got my RPM trim adjusted. Last, uh, my SCAS, I gotta engage that. So this is done after I roll the throttle up to 100% because my hydraulic pressure has to be uh, up high enough to engage the SCAS servos or to keep the, the SCAS servos functioning. Uh, it won't turn on at idle because there's not enough pressure in the hydraulic system because the pump is turning off. The pump is uh, splined into the main transmission. So the hydraulic pump is not turning fast enough to provide enough hydraulic pressure to keep the SCAS servos engaged. So once my uh, NR is at 100%, which means my transmission is at 100%, that pump is operating at full RPMs and it's providing full hydraulic pressure. Now I can turn my SCAS system on. So I turn that power on and then turn the pitch roll and the yaw channels on. So you noted that my last remaining uh, caution flags went off as that system was turned on. So now my SCAS is engaged. I don't need engine anti-ice because we're not flying into icing conditions. And I don't need pitot heater because we're not flying into, again, icing conditions. Heater over temp caution light, check. So it is not over temping, probably because we don't have it turned on. And then weapon systems initialize and check as required. Note that is a CPO task. So if I uh, step forward in his checklist, uh, weapon systems, where is that? MMS bore site, somewhere in there is weapon systems. Ah, there it is. So that's a CPO task. Uh, so we wouldn't necessarily be doing that. If he's still bogged down and trying to configure the nav system or whatever, uh, I can, now that I'm complete with my run-up, I can start assisting with doing this other stuff. So all that would have taken eh, about three to five minutes to get through through that stuff, what we just took an hour and 20 minutes to do. Um, meanwhile, the left seater is continuing on with his portion of the checklist. Uh, so as far as the right seat is concerned, I'm done. We are ready to take this aircraft off the ground except for this still being tumbled here. Um, there's nothing preventing us. Uh, we are ready to launch, other than we don't have a configured nav system, we don't have a configured weapon system, comm systems, etc. But the aircraft can fly. So the left seat side of the checklist will be uh, video number five, I guess. So we'll get to that. So uh, I'm about to run out of voice, so I think this is a good opportunity to stop it here. Um, hope you got something out of this one. I know there will be a lot of questions. I'm happy to answer them. I'm glad that people are getting some out of these videos. Uh, it's fun and refreshing to delve back into the books and uh, kind of get back into the KW. So I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm uh, gratified and happy to see the enthusiasm that uh, seems like the community out there has for this project. Uh, we're doing our best to get it right. You noted all the errata and things that uh, I know I said we're going to fix prior to release. So I'm capturing those as I go through these and we go through testing. Um, so you'll get a good product at the end of it. Uh, with that, I'll say uh, this is uh, horrendous. Uh, checking off the net. We'll talk to you next time. Look for me in the video number five here in a few days, uh, maybe a week next weekend or so. Talk to you later. Run us out.